lunch on the Friday of LCA 2018. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respect, uh, respects to the elders, both past and present. Our next presenter, uh, I was witnessing connecting a laptop uh, to the, uh, well, he was having difficulty with, uh, with X Randa, and this is not something I've, uh, I've experienced before. Um, so I feel very privileged to have watched that, and now you can feel very privileged to watch Keith Packard present on virtual reality on Linux. Please make him welcome. Thanks so much. I, uh, I, think, I, I think this is probably the seventh or eighth year in a row that I presented on Friday at the conference. I'm feeling a little persecuted. <laughs> Uh, so this is some, uh, some work. It has a, actually a pretty interesting history. This work was started uh, last year in Hobart. Uh, Dave Early and I were sitting out in the sunshine uh, enjoying the sail sailboats in the, in the harbor there and uh, talking about what we should do about uh, connecting virtual reality devices to a Linux system. And we came up with a bunch of crazy schemes, and I'll go through those. Um, um, and I got a little sunburned, and I enjoyed the sunshine, and I think at the end of the hour we had actually come up with a plan, and we thought, oh, this will only take a couple of weeks to do. It's a really simple plan. Um, of course, I knew that in reality it would take a lot longer, and in fact, we're just now uh, starting to get the last of the bits of the code merged upstream. Uh, this is uh, work uh, sponsored by Valve. I'm a consultant for Valve uh, at this point doing this work. Uh, they are uh, building virtual reality systems. Uh, they have a bunch of games. Uh, you may have played some of them. Um, it's interesting to take those games and think about how they might work in a virtual reality environment. Uh, virtual reality environments have a bunch of different components. You can see them here on the screen. Uh, you have the traditional virtual reality headset, which blocks you off from reality, giving you only virtual reality. Uh, it's great if you want to stumble into walls, chairs, and uh, tables. Um, there are a couple of location beacons. Uh, the, the HTC Vive beacons actually have a little rotating device in them, so they sit, on, sit in your office and kind of hum quietly to themselves. They have a lot of cool LEDs inside, so they're uh, kind of nice wall art. Uh, you're supposed to bolt them onto the wall and have them in fixed in place. I, of course, stuck them on a shelf in my office. Um, and then you have these crazy handsets uh, that you're supposed to interact with the world in. Uh, they have a really accurate model of these so that when you're playing in the virtual reality environment, you can actually see the handsets, which is really creepy. Um, I mean, you're sitting there, you have these goggles on, and the entire world is gone except for the handsets. And you, oh, I can find where those are. It's kind of fun. Um, how many of you have played with uh, virtual reality headsets? How many of you actually, oh, everybody, okay. <laughs> I appear to be the last person on the planet to uh, ever even get one of these. Uh, the only reason I purchased one of these was because I was doing work to make them work, which is a pretty traditional way for me to get new hardware. Um, obviously, uh, the, the, the headsets are interesting. Uh, they have to have an IMU in them, an inertial measurement unit, to actually know where they are in space at a, a very high resolution in time. They have to have a na navigation interaction with these beacons to know where they are absolutely in time to, to reorient themselves. Um, and then they have to have a display in them and some optics. Uh, so the display in this particular one is about 2K by 1K. Um, and then it kind of splits that in half and it has a bunch of lenses. Uh, so they're, they're kind of more complicated than you would hope uh, in terms of actually using them. Um, in the, H &B, in the, in the, uh, in the um, process of displaying the image, it actually goes through a bunch of uh, computation. Uh, so the left eye buffer and the right eye buffer are computed separately by the application and put into a, a unified frame buffer um, eventually. Um, they have to go through an optical transformation. There are optics, lenses in the headset uh, that distort the image. Um, and in order for you to see the world uh, in a reasonable facsimile of what you want to see, you have to back out that transformation. Um, and then you have to take the fact that this is an OLED display. And in an OLED display, every single pixel of the OLED display has a slightly different intensity. Um, it's not really noticeable on your phones because you, you, the phone has a fairly static image on it. Or when it's animated, you're expecting to see things change. In, the, in, in a head-mounted display, when you have a static image, which is to say an image of the world, and you move your head, the image of the world moves across the field of the, of the display. And so even though you're uh, viewing what is, what, is, what is perceptually a static image, on the display you're re-rendering it all the time and recomputing all these transformations, putting the resulting image in different pixels. And that means this optical uh, intensity variation that's inherent in OLED displays is really, really visible and a terrible artifact. And it kind of breaks that, uh, the, uh, the, the illusion that you're looking at something fixed in space. 
So they actually, the HTC Vive actually has in the hardware, it actually has a map of the pixel intensity of every pixel on the screen. And so when you're, when you're presenting the image to the screen, it actually backs out that transformation and adjusts the intensity of every pixel on the screen to, ca to counteract this variance in the OLED display. And then once you've got all that backed out, you can actually uh, send the image to the display and uh, get it presented to the user. So there's actually a bunch of computation. Uh, one of the Im important under, uh, things you need to understand here is if I just take my regular Linux desktop and dump it into this frame buffer, it's not going to be useful. So this display is inherently not a part of your desktop environment natively. Now obviously I can, I can take uh, the images of the environment uh, and construct a projection of those into this environment and give yourself a desktop here. Uh, but, uh, but your existing Windows system isn't going to be able to use this device as, a, as an output, uh, uh, directly as an output. Uh, uh, one of the other interesting parts about uh, head-mounted displays is they are probably the most hard real-time we have on the desktop. We think about trying to make sure your mouse interactions are smooth and the cursor follows your mouse, but when the cursor f uh, fails to follow your mouse and kind of jerks across the string, uh, the screen, it's like, yeah, I don't really feel like my hand is connected to the mouse, and it's annoying. When the scene in front of your face doesn't track your head motions correctly, you get violently ill. Right? This is a real, real problem um, uh, to the point where um, uh, a lot of the people that I interact with who are you know, of my age um, really cannot use these devices uh, in, a, in a very, in, in, often cannot use these devices because it provides this perceptual uh, disorient, uh, very disorienting perceptual experience where you get you know, even the slightest latency between a head motion and the reprojection of the scene into that uh, moved, uh, moved environment. Um, so we really have to get uh, we really have to get the times nailed. Every single frame has to be displayed, not only correctly in terms of what the pixel content is, but correctly in terms of time. So we've taken a two-dimensional, make sure the scene is correct uh, problem that we've been working on uh, to get rid of tearing on environments in our, our games for the last 30 years. Now we have a three-dimensional thing where we're adding this dimension of time. Um, the, uh, the, fa the slowest that, we, uh, that the uh, human factors people uh, tell us we can go with a head-mounted display is about 90 frames a second. Now that's 50% faster than your typical display. Um, we cannot miss frames. We absolutely have to hit every frame. Uh, of course, because you're playing a game or looking at some other, uh, uh, some other environment, the geometry and the textures and all the data necessary to co uh, construct that image vary uh, uh, for every frame. Right? Every frame is going to be a little bit different. Um, as I said before, it's really, it's definitely not part of the desktop. You can't, you, you can't uh, just present an image in this frame buffer. Uh, just presenting a static image, uh, which is one of the little demos um, uh, that I would love to be able to run, but I don't have the, I don't have the head mounted display with me. Just presenting a static image is really hard because you, now you have to track the user's head and make sure that that image is displayed correctly so that the user sees that image as if it were static in the world and not static on the display. Um, in debugging this, I often get a static image in the display. Um, and let me tell you, when, when you're all of a sudden your, your, uh, your, um, your 3D image freezes and it stops moving when you move your head, if you don't hold your head still, you're going to fall over. Uh, because you, you, just, you don't understand just how tightly coupled your vestibular system and your visual system are uh, in terms of getting feedback about your, uh, the orientation of your body. Um, I sit down when I'm doing development of this system, and I have, I have fallen out of my chair several times. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like, wait a minute, this is, is this going to work? Um, okay, I'm sorry for the eye chart here. Um, so when Dave and I were sitting outside, uh, outside enjoying the harbor in, uh, in Hobart last year, we talked about a bunch of different possible ways of getting HMD, uh, HMD displays integrated, head-mounted displays integrated into the Linux desktop. Um, one easy way would just be to have some, uh, some conventions uh, to hide the displays from regular applications. It's like, okay, so your head-mounted display application can just tell the system, yeah, that display uh, don't let other window, uh, you know, let's develop some conventions and then we'll go change all the desktops so that they know about the conventions and that display will just be hidden from the desktop. All the, the rest of the system would be exactly the same. We'd have an X window system sitting there. Um, it would be part of the frame buffer. You'd have the regular DRM interactions with the kernel. So we wouldn't have to change anything 
any of the system software. We just have to change every desktop environment on the planet. Um, some of the, the real reason that we, other than, oh my god, I have to go fix KDE and, and GNOME, um, the other real problem, of course, is that we have tremendous latency problems with, uh, with talking to the Windows system. The Windows system is not uh, a hard real-time environment. It really is like, well, kind of a best effort. You give me a frame and yeah, I'll put it up on the screen sometime. Um, especially when you start talking about a compositing desktop environment, where all of a sudden you're taking the images from multiple applications and blending them together and putting that on the screen. So when you start talking about adding an additional level of complexity like that, all of a sudden latency through the Windows system becomes a real problem. And this notion of adding more computation to a system which is already, already computationally constrained is a real, uh, a real problem. Uh, the other, thing, the other uh, thing we talked about was just using render to hide the display is changing the ex, uh, extension so that the desktop couldn't see the display. Again, no kernel changes required, few X changes required. Gets rid of the need to change the desktop environments, that was nice. But again, if we're displaying the image through the X window system, all of a sudden we've got all the latencies uh, involved in having another process in the chain. Uh, we, could, we could create a meta display server to manage all the output so that the window system and the head mounted display would send their outputs down to the meta display server and it would figure out what to do with the kernel. Well, that gets rid of a lot of the latency problems inherent in having a window system involved. Uh, you don't have any compositing uh, system uh, going on, so you're not blending images together. Uh, you still have another application involved, so it sounds better. No kernel changes, uh, changes required. It, it, it largely addresses the latency issue, but it still has another process involved. So you have more context switches. Um, and in our new, uh, in our new Spectre world, uh, context switches are getting even more expensive. So we want to do, a, we fortunately got to avoid that. So the, uh, the change that we, Dave and I came up with that we thought was going to work pretty well was to, was to change the kernel. Because, you know, we can hack the kernel. It's free software. It's awesome. We can change anything we need to do. Um, to change the kernel to actually say, OK, this application gets to talk to this monitor. And this application, oh, this application can talk to this monitor. And that way we can have this application driving the window system and this application driving the HMD through the kernel. And that way they, they don't interact at all in the display process. Uh, this hides the displays from the Windows system nicely, gets rid of our latency problems, we don't have to change desktop environments. Uh, we do have to change X in the kernel, but hey, Dave and, Dave and I are kernel hackers and we're both X hackers, so that was like, hey, this is right in our wheelhouse. We know how to change these parts of the system. Uh, so the goal here, of course, is to get X or any other Windows system out of the picture, right? It's not helping. I don't need management of uh, geometry. On the, on, the, on the display. Uh, all the input devices are these custom HMD input devices, so I don't need, uh, I don't need to multiplex those uh, to different, uh, demultiplex those to multiple applications. Um, so the Windows system is really just a problem here, so we're going to get it out of the way. Uh, we're going to make the HMD app display directly to the device, right? So when you talk about the DRM environment, which is the way that we do 3D graphics in the, in the Linux environment, the DRM client already talks directly to the kernel to do all of, its, all of its rendering. It's called the direct rendering manager for a reason. Applications don't talk to the Windows system when they want to do 3D graphics, they talk to the kernel. Um, so I've already got a kernel app file descriptor, right? I already am talking to the device. All I need to, to do is make that uh, file descriptor more capable or give me another file descriptor that can do the additional things that I need. So all I need to do is add the ability, the, a direct mode setting ability to this application. But of course, the mode setting stuff is a privileged operation. You wouldn't want any random application coming along and stealing and changing modes and like putting up a little window that says, hey, you know, your screen is locked. Would you type your password for me? Oh, I didn't mean that password. I meant your Facebook password. It's like, why do I need my Facebook password to unlock my screen? So we don't want applications coming in and hijacking your, your screens. And so that's why access to the display is a privileged operation, usually mediated through the window system. Uh, so we didn't want to just open up uh, access to the displays to the world. Um, there is a particular vendor which did this this way. Um, they do a closed source kernel driver. Uh, we decided that we needed to retain our uh, secure environment. So we have a mechanism that pulls the display out of the window system and hands it to the HMD application. Uh, and, and this also uh, retains a little bit of control so that when an application crashes, we wanted the, X, uh, the Windows system to be able to find out about that. Oh, your application crashed. And yeah, it left the display in kind of a mess. Uh, so we want X to be able to kind of pick up the pieces and put the display back together and, and be able to use it for the desktop again uh, if you want to do that or hand it back to the HMD application. So now we have a mechanism 
for providing the display to the HMD, and we have a mechanism for the system to recover when an application crashes, because how many of you have ever played a game and had it crash? Yeah. And let me tell you, when you're doing beta application development uh, for Valve, their games, when they ship them, are way more stable than when they're under development. <laughs> I, I know, it, it, just like any other system. Uh, okay, so what we did is we came up with this notion of a lease. You know, I, I, it's a kind of a cheesy metaphor. You've got to come up with a metaphor for everything, and naming is hard. Uh, so we came up with this notion that you're going to, you're not going to own the output. It's not really yours to go in. So it's like you put nails in the wall. Uh, you have to patch them up before you leave, or you have to pay somebody to come and patch them up when you leave. You're not allowed to put new carpet down without asking permission. So in a similar way, you have a limited access to this resource for a limited amount of time. Uh, for the time that your application runs. You can't keep using it. So the, the lessor, the window system here, owns all of the resources and controls them all in perpetuity. And what it does, though, is it, it gives you a, a right to use that resource so that it promises that it's not going to come in. Just like your landlord has to call you a day before when, when he wants to come in and inspect the property. Uh, in the same way, the X server promises not to come in and bug the, the application when it's, when it's busy uh, displaying stuff. So, you know, the metaphor went pretty well. And the lessee, of course, is this VR application. It gets to do uh, mode setting on that output and do presentation on that output while it's running. Um, it can even do DPMS on and off. So you can turn the monitor on and off and do power saving if you like. Uh, and then when the lease terminates, which is to say when the application exits, or when the user says, hey, that application is doing something bad, uh, please stop it from displaying. So you can either, either the application can terminate or the window system can take the lease back. Um, then the lesser gets the display back and it, and it can clean up. Okay, hello. Awesome. Oh, here we go. Okay, uh, as usual, when you're doing new stuff in the kernel, uh, you get sidelined. Uh, this is, you know, I, I, I think any system software, any software development is a sequence of yak shaving exercises. Here's one. Um, we had this horrible API for, doing, uh, for monitoring vBlanks in the kernel. So what you want to do with the vBlank is you want to find out what's, what's the current frame count, and please send me an event when you get to this frame count. And that lets you do things synchronized to, to the refresh of the monitor. So every time the monitor displays another frame, it's gonna, it might be able to send you an event. The little counter increments, then it might send you an event. The current API was a single IO control, which did three different things depending on the parameters. Well, that's a terrible interface. Uh, in, in particular, for the usage that I needed, had a couple of really bad limitations. The first limitation was it had a 32-bit counter, which means that after a couple of years, that counter wrapped which means I can't treat the counter value as unique. For all practical purposes, yeah, a couple of years is a long, long time, and I should be able to treat it as unique. But having experience in this environment, I've had users say, I ran my X application for four and a half years, and after four and a half years, it stopped working. Can you tell me why? It's like, uh, that's a long test debug cycle. <laughs> So I'm really hesitant to put any, any counter system like this that has this kind of wrapping behavior, where after a couple of years it wraps. It's like if it was after 10 minutes, yeah, I'm going to test the heck out of that, and it's not gonna, I'm going to get all the bugs out. If it's, after, uh, if it's after heat death of the universe, not a problem. Um, the frame counter, of course, uh, increments every frame, and at 90 hertz, that's about 11 milliseconds, so every 11 milliseconds I get another, another, another bump, which is a couple of years long. So what I did is, in, uh, so what I wanted to use instead, and what the, uh, what the Vulkan uh, graphics API uses, is a 32-bit counter. Well, a 32-bit counter is 4 billion couple of years. So that's like, you know, longer than I'll be around, I won't get any support calls. Uh, and in fact, our planet won't be here uh, when that counter wraps. So I think we're good to go. Um, and the other real problem for me, though, was that it only supported microsecond resolution, right? Microseconds are a really short amount of time until you start worrying about, you know, how many microseconds am I, you know, how many tens of nanoseconds am I spending rendering this particular line. You really need a higher resolution timer for this. So instead of having one API that did three things, I created two, uh, two interfaces that would give me the data that I needed, a way to get the current sequence and a way to queue an event 
uh, to be delivered at a particular time. Pretty simple. 64-bit counters, nanosecond resolution, because K-time uh, gives me nanoseconds, it's all good. So I kind of got sidetracked on this. Um, this took a surprising amount of time to get integrated into the kernel because it's a tiny little API and the, spec spec the specification is really clear and easy to read, which means that when you're, when you're reviewing the code, it's like, oh, I would like to change that word from of to is. You know, you, I got, it got bike shedded, as uh, kernel stuff often does. It was a little frustrating. I thought, well, this is an easy thing to add, but it took like three months. Uh, welcome to kernel development. If any of you saw uh, Daniel Venter's talk yesterday, uh, you'll know what that experience is like. And this was, this was in the DRM ecosystem, uh, where actually things are pretty nice. Uh, okay, so now I, did, now I put together the leases, and I needed to, get to, get, I needed to tell my story about the, the patches that I, that I wanted, the changes that I wanted to make to the kernel. Uh, so the, the, patches, the patches came in kind of three chunks. The first chunk was changing a bunch of internal APIs so that I had the hooks in the places that I needed. Uh, this is the, I like to do a patch sequence this way. It's easier for people to review the parts that touch their code uh, because there's no functional change. So here I am changing interfaces all over DRM, adding additional parameters, changing APIs, doing a bunch of stuff, no functional change. So this uh, part of the patch sequence did nothing to actually what the kernel did, just added APIs and parameters and changed some functionality and exposed some new potential uh, functionality. Then I added a bunch of new code, added, added the core of the change, that didn't touch any of the other code in the system. So that code could be reviewed kind of as a piece. It's like, oh, we're using interfaces in this new way, but it doesn't actually uh, change those interfaces. So you can review those, those parts of the change set differently. And then finally, the, the final set of patches takes this new functionality and exposes it to user space. So the, the, nice reason, the reason I separated out those last two is you can review and merge the infrastructure pieces without changing how the system works. You're not adding any additional, any additional uh, attack surface to the environment uh, until you actually add the functionality to user space. It makes the, kind of the security questions separate from the implementation questions. Again, a nice way of telling the story uh, to the maintainers that are going to need to help you review the, the code and get it merged. So the first thing I did is I added, uh, I needed to be able to make resource lookup, in, which is uh, all the resources that I'm talking about, outputs and uh, um, cathode ray tube controllers, CRTCs, uh, and all these various uh, uh, resources exposed by the kernel, they're all, just, they're all just named with small integer numbers. So I needed to be able to do access control on those small numbers. So I needed to be able to know who was trying to access this resource. And so I added a who parameter, which is to say which file descriptor is associated with these resources, resource lookups, so I could do some access control. Totally mechanical change. It literally added a parameter to a bunch of functions and had those functions uh, use that parameter to, uh, to do some access control. Uh, fairly easy to review. It was a nice small change. That was good. Uh, and then I added the heart of the lease infrastructure, right? And then I added the, all the bulk of the code. Um, each, ma each, uh, each DRM master, which is something which can do mode setting operations, now has a, lease, a list of lessees. So each, 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 um, each uh, uh, agent within the environment that can uh, manipulate the, uh, the, the output resources now has a list of people that he, that, that, that uh, agent has uh, leased uh, portions of his uh, resource space to, and that those uh, lessees can then go and do whatever they want with that. And then each lessee, of course, has a list of mode resources. I tried to make the data structures as simple as possible. Uh, this is not a performance sensitive part of the environment, right? I'm doing this. I'm doing this for mode setting and for displaying a frame once every 11 milliseconds. So if the access control checks take a little extra time because the data structures are simpler and easier to understand, that's OK. So it was a conscious choice to trade off simplicity and clarity of the code uh, for, um, for performance. Uh, in particular, every time you do and every time the um, Every time you want to check to see if you can lease an object, you have to walk over all the existing lessees, there's probably none, uh, looking to see if they have leased any of those objects by walking over the list of objects they have leased. So it's kind of a, you know, a, doubly, a double linear search of all the lessees and all the objects they've leased. Uh, because you typically lease two objects, uh, a, a CRTC and an output, um, you tip, and you typically have one lessee in the environment, um, I didn't think those linear searches were too bad. Uh, yeah, walking over a list of length one and then a list of length two. Um, uh, least access control. Um, 
ah, this is wrong. We only actually uh, lease access control for uh, connectors and CRTCs. The connector is uh, the port that's on your, your, your laptop, so it's a HDMI port or a DP port. And a CRTC is a scan out engine. These are, uh, the name comes from a cathode ray tube controller. How many of you still have any cathode ray tubes in your homes? Really? Are they plugged into anything? Okay, the only person that I know that has a CRT in their house is a, a friend of mine's son who plays uh, Smash Brothers, which is a video game, a competitive video game. And you, you literally can't use an LCD for that yet because the lag between the, uh, the video connector and the LCD is like more than a frame, and they're sensitive to that. <laughs> yeah, competitive video games. I, it, it really is awesome to watch, and I have nothing against the, the people who are talented at that, but wow. <laughs> yeah, I really can't use an LCD. That additional 11 milliseconds of latency just sucks. It kills my game. Yeah, okay. So that's where the name comes from. Uh, the access control is, uh, as I said, I separated it out from the lease infrastructure patch and it touches only the access control code in some very minor ways. And then I added some new IO controls that actually expose this up to user space. And it hooks, that, hooks this uh, uh, underlying infrastructure up to, uh, uh, exposes it to the user space. We have, we have your DRM master, which is the, like the w w window system opens the core device, has access to all the resources, and it, it creates this new DRM master, which is the lessee, right? It has just a limited set. So the DRM master controls all the CRTCs and it controls all the outputs. And the lessee then is granted uh, temporary access to one of the CRTCs and one of the output, one of the connectors that, that's connected to the head mounted display. Um, and so the, the lessee can't manipulate those other outputs. It can only uh, manipulate the ones that it has access to. Um, and, and also usefully, when it lists the set of outputs and CRTCs that are available, it only sees the ones that ha it has leased. So when you, you can just run a, a, an existing application um, and, it, and change just the part where it says, please open the, uh, the, 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 the graphics device. And instead of opening the graphics device, go get a lease. And now once you have that file descriptor, the rest of your existing DRM code just works. And I'll show you a demo of that in a second. Um, and oh, I guess we have uh, literally a second. We're going to do a little demo here. I was hoping to do two demos, uh, and it's really sad. One of my demos, uh, when I tried it about an hour ago, it was just seg faulting. It's really sad. So we'll run, we'll run the other one. And of course, uh, my, my demo setup got completely scrambled because the, uh, this USB-C to HDMI adapter stopped working. Uh, and so we had to reset everything. In any case. So what I've done here is I've created an application uh, called xLease. Um, and what it does is it goes and grabs a lease from the existing X server. And then it starts another X server and says, hey, use this lease as your connector. Uh, so uh, effectively that um, you're going to run an X server uh, on, a, on a display, and we're going to run it on this display up here so you can actually see it. And I don't think I've tested this script in, in entirety, so we'll see if it actually works. And you can't see what I'm doing here. I apologize for that. Actually, I, no, that would be bad. Uh, so wish me luck. This is a live demo of a script I've never run before. Hey, look at that. Okay, so here's another X server, and I can't type at this, of course, because I don't have any input devices. All I've done is lease an output. Uh, but I can actually run other, uh, other X applications. Uh, we'll run some performance measurements. Yeah, we can run a little benchmark here. Who knows what this application is called? Anybody? This is the only X application I ran for years and years and years. This is our 2D, uh, 2D performance tester called X11Perf. <laughs> it's now measuring how fast you can paint text on the screen. Uh, it's you know, near and dear to my heart. Uh, so it's currently painting uh, 20 million characters a second on the screen. So that's, that's leasing. So, and now I can just go ahead and um, I, can, I can go ahead and kill that X server. Uh, let's see. And th this X server is running as a normal user. It has no privileges because the only privilege the X server needs in the system is the privilege to open 
the, uh, the display device, the master display device that's going to give it access to the outputs because this X server has no access to those outputs. It doesn't need any privilege at all. Uh, I think that we could actually do some pretty cool stuff with that. Uh, in particular, we've had a long-standing um, long request to do multi-seat in our environment where you want to be able to have two people using the computer and have, uh, you know, you have a, uh, I have a Radeon card at home that has four, uh, four display outputs, thank you. Um, it would be really lovely to be able to actually have multiple people using that same computer. You multiple mice, multiple keyboards, we support all of that. All of the input infrastructure is all sitting there. We have these seat IDs that get passed around. You can, you can set up your, um, your hot pluggy environment so that the seat IDs map specific keyboards to specific seat IDs. The X server has a seat ID. So now all of a sudden I should be able to, pretty quickly, I didn't get the demo ready in time, I apologize. I should be able to actually just hack configuration files now and have true multi-seat where I have a native X server running on each output and each connected to their own input devices. Uh, at full, at full, uh, full speed. So we'll go ahead and, uh, whew, it worked. That's amazing. Uh, I have no output. Oh, there we go. And as you see, I killed that application. Thank you. All I, did, all I did was kill the X server. I terminated with extreme prejudice. The master X server was able to recover and get things back up on the screen. Uh, I'm sad to say that um, I think is my other... Yeah, the, um, the uh, LibreOffice is now crashing whenever it, uh, whenever it uh, gets switched away from, oops. Yeah, now I'll have to say, uh, tell LibreOffice, please don't recover that document because I was, I was really fine with it having crashed. Um, now we'll step through a bunch of slides and get back to where we were and I apologize for that. Okay. It was a blank screen, excellent. Uh, okay, so the kernel does not mask those resources from the master, right? So the X server can still see all the kernel resources. It could, in fact, mess with them. So it still has the key to your house, and the only thing keeping it from breaking in the middle of the night and stealing all your stuff is contract law. So it has a contract with the client. There's no, there's no enforcement of the kernel API. However, on the other side of the wire, when you have a, dis a, a, a display environment like GNOME or KDE, we wanted a little more stronger uh, guarantees that the, uh, that the desktop environment wasn't going to mess with your least outputs. So X changes the rules on its side of the wire. So an X application, when you've created a lease, X applications can no longer see, those or, see or manipulate those resources. So the semantics to the kernel, where the master, the, the, less, the lessor, still has full access and could do, could do whatever it wanted with those outputs, but has promised not to. On the X side, for X applications, when you've created a lease, X applications cannot touch those outputs. They don't even see them. So we did a bunch of uh, minor little semantic changes so that things kind of work. Um, no, nothing crashes anymore, which is good. Uh, when I first did this, um, we, uh, I was kind of uh, faking things out in the wrong way, and applications are crashing left and left and right. <clears throat> More testing is probably required. <clears throat> well, of course, X applications, we've given up on the notion of actual hot plugging things to X applications. There's resource IDs. Uh, so we, we, we pretend that they're not useful anymore and that they're not connected. So instead of your head mounted display disappearing from your X environment, uh, we just pretend that there's nothing connected. No, there's nothing connected, honest. Uh, don't, look at the, don't look behind the curtain. Um, and that the, the CRTC that you're using to drive that thing, yeah, it's not actually a useful one. It, it, there's literally nothing it can do. Don't even try to use it. Um, and of course, uh, we actually do check to make sure that the applications aren't using them. Um, let's see. So that's how we expose them through X. Oh, um, by the way, uh, yesterday I saw a patch sequence that adds this, adds this stuff uh, to the Wayland protocol. There's no code yet. Uh, but somebody is start already starting to think about how this might work in a Wayland environment, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, here's the R&R uh, the additions, uh, the protocol additions for Rander. It's not that exciting. Uh, we even get events so that application can see when leases come and go. Um, one of the interesting parts here is that there's this, uh, the, this uh, request to free a current lease. Now, you can, do, you can free the lease and let that application continue to run, uh, which you might want to do if you were just going to uh, wait for that application to terminate. Or if you've still got that ID for that lease, you can actually terminate the lease with prejudice. So if you're holding on the lease and you've got an application you're not really sure is going to do the right thing, uh, you can actually take the lease back uh, from an ex-client. And then those resources come back to you and the client has no access to them. 
Uh, we added the, uh, that, this is when we added the kernel uh, API ability to also revoke an existing lease. And I don't know if I'm quite happy with having that kind of mixed into the same request, but when you do revoke that lease, the XID has to go away. Maybe that API is not great. I don't know. Uh, so all of this stuff sits on top of an existing mechanism that we added for DRI3, the ability to pass a file descriptor from the X server to an X application. We've been able to pass file descriptors uh, over Unix domain sockets for years and years and years, um, and we never used that in X. Uh, DRI2 has this hokey mechanism where the application opens up the kernel device and then asks the kernel to bless it. So it passes a magic cookie to the, to the X server, and the X server passes the cookie to the kernel. It's hokier than heck. Uh, by passing file descriptors around, all of a sudden, all of that got really a lot cleaner. We had to add a lot of infrastructure into X to be able to do this. Uh, but now that we've got the infrastructure, doing things like this was a piece of cake. So now the X server creates a lease, and the lease is represented as a file descriptor. It's, got, it's a file descriptor that's got access to these resources in the kernel. And now I can take that file descriptor and pass it to my application, and the application can now do whatever it wants with it. Uh, for the demo that you saw, I actually hacked up the X server to look in a magic environment variable for a file descriptor. It's like, okay, take a magic environment variable, uh, convert that from a string to a number, and just start doing I.O. controls on that file descriptor. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, that, obviously just a demo. Um, but that's worked really well. The ability to pass file descriptors is now something we use in a lot more places, um, and I think we'll, uh, think we'll be doing it even more in the future. It's a really powerful primitive. Wow, thank you, LibreOffice. What did it do? Uh, there's a bunch of X fix-ups that I can need, that we needed. Um, I'm sorry about the fact that there's an image in the back of this. I don't know what happened. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, so so at, when I added leases, there was a pile of little minor things I needed to do to X to fix it up. Uh, and here's some of them we had to mess with. So there's a separate cursor on the screen. And I have to make sure the cursor is displayed when you're running X and is not displayed when the lease starts up because it's managed separately in the kernel APIs. This is awesome. When I do a mode set, the, cur the cursor may reappear and it may not. It's separately configured. I don't know why. Uh, but so the X server has to do a bunch of man uh, management to make sure that, that lease, uh, the cursor appears at the right times. The other thing I did is I actually wanted to let applications know the mapping between these X resources and the kernel resources so that when, it's, when, when it finally got its lease and could talk to the kernel, it would know which of those resource IDs were the ones that X was talking about. So a little mapping information. Um, oh. <laughs> The, uh, now I know where that image, so this image was, uh, this, the image that you can't see is actually the image for this slide. Um, I've got about a couple minutes to talk about the Vulkan changes. My original plan was to have a Vulkan extension that you pass this file descriptor into Vulkan and it would just use that for all of its, all of its DRM stuff. Um, that turns out to be hard, not because implementing that extension was difficult, that took about five minutes, but because the standardization process for getting a new extension through Vulkan looked really heavyweight. And there was an existing extension which did most of what I needed that NVIDIA had implemented. Uh, the NVIDIA uh, extension is called Acquire XLib Display EXT. Um, it uses the fact that uh, any NVIDIA, any application that talks to an NVIDIA kernel can basically do whatever it wants to display resources, I think. Uh, so there's no access control, so they didn't have this access control problem that I was worried about. Um, yeah, well, you are loading a binary module into your kernel. Uh, you get to keep both pieces. Um, so I, what I did for the, the final implementation was actually to implement their extensions in kind of a different way, uh, which meant that the, the extension is somewhat incompatible. In their extension, the HMD is never visible through X. And in my extension, the resources are never, avail never visible through the, through, the, uh, through the client until you get the, re the lease from X. So the, the, re the extensions, I could use their extension, but I had to invert some stuff. So when you have an application that wants to use these extensions, you get to have the X path, and you, uh, the, the, uh, the real X path, and you get to have the NVIDIA magic special case path. Uh, fortunately, they are mutually compatible in that they, you, know, you can kind of tell which one you should use. You try mine, and if it doesn't work, you try theirs. Uh, and that's what I did in the valve code, and that worked great. Uh, and I think that's about yeah, the end of the, end, uh, end of the talk here. Um, I, added, I recently added another, another extension uh, to, uh, to do some more timing stuff, and there's a bunch more stuff in this stuff. In any case, 
virtual reality in Linux is working great and it should be coming to your desktop pretty soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, put your hand up if you'd like to ask Keith a question and Todd will run a microphone over to you. Uh, deep color surfaces HDR. What? Deep color surfaces HDR. Um, so the nice thing about exposing the, the direct kernel interfaces is all of a sudden the Windows system limitations in doing that which are present today and being fixed go away. All right, so if your kernel device supports these kind of interfaces, you can now use them directly from an application. Uh, anyone else have questions? Doesn't seem like it. Awesome. Um, oh. On behalf of the organizers, I have this nondescript paper bag for you. I'm told it contains something. Awesome. Thank you very uh, much. Everybody, please thank Keith Packard. Uh, it is now lunchtime. There is a barbecue uh, downstairs on Alumni Green, I think, uh, to, uh, 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 because most places nearby are closed. So there's a barbecue. Uh, enjoy it and see you after lunch. <laughs>